let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you very much for the study tonight. We thank you because of the love, the interest, the desire you have given us to know you, to know your word, to know your mind, to have the revelation of your truth. Lord, we count it a great privilege that you will count us worthy to know your word and to know what it means to serve you and to follow you. Therefore, Lord, we pray that today as we come, you will grant us the illumination, the instruction, the enlightenment of the Spirit of God, so that the Spirit of God himself will enlighten us and teach us and instruct us the things we need to know in these words, in Jesus' name. Thank you for what we've studied in the past. Thank you for the application of that word in every life. We're asking today that you will lead us deeper into your truth in Jesus' name. That these words will come alive and be applicable to every life. That Lord will be nearer, closer to you and will be the better spiritually as we look at these words together. Thank you Lord for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. We come together today once again to study from the Word of God. As you know, the Lord has been taking us consistently through this important book of Exodus, the second book of the Bible. And you will see as we've gone from chapter to chapter, from verse to verse, the wisdom of God, the power of God, the holiness of God. In fact, it's been so wonderful as the Lord has been leading us and if you have been coming regularly, I'm sure that you would have increased in your knowledge of God. In your knowledge of the demands of God from his redeemed people. Last week, we looked at Exodus chapter 20. And in Exodus chapter 20, the Lord revealed his mind. And he compressed all that he wanted to teach the children of Israel into ten basic important commandments which we looked at last week. Today the Lord is making some explanation, making as well some ap application and some amplification of some of the commandments Israel needed to be taught on the importance of truth. The truth that life is precious. You see, considering the children of Israel, they had seen many atrocities of slavery, of cruelty, of violent disregard for life and human rights. And they could easily make themselves to become careless and thoughtless about other people's lives and rights. Because of that, God now was going to teach them respect for the sacredness of lives of other people. As you will see from verse 1, it talks about these judgments. Look at that. Now these are the judgments which thou shalt set before them. The Ten Commandments had been given. And these judgments took Israel's circumstances into consideration. What I mean is this. Let me show you now some verses in this passage. In verse 2, all through to verse 6, the Lord was teaching them about the relationship of the master to the servant. That was very necessary because their background in Egypt was, the, was to see the attitude of cruelty, violence from masters, task masters to their servants. And the Lord was telling them, it will not be so among you. In verses 7 to 11, the Lord was talking about how they will deal with their maids or maid servants. Because those maid servants were women, they were tender. And the Lord wanted them to show some tenderness and mercy and compassion unto them. Well, you will see that the Lord was applying his word of mercy and compassion to the children of Israel, to the commandments he had given them. And now, from verse 12, all through to verse 27, the Lord gave some judgment, some verdict upon the people that might not respect the lives of other people, that might take away the lives of others. Verse 12, he that smiteth a man so that he die shall surely be put to death. In verse 15, 
He that smiteth his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. In verse 16, he that stealeth a man and selleth him, or he that or he be found in his hand, he shall surely be put to death. In verse 18, if, if men strive together and one smite another with a stone or with his fist, that he die not, but keepeth his bed. If he rise again and walk abroad upon a staff, then shall he that smote him be quit, only shall pay for the loss of his time, and shall cause him to be thoroughly healed. In verse 28, If an ox got a man or a woman that they die, then the ox shall be surely put to death, shall be stoned, and his flesh shall not be eaten. But the owner shall be quit. And in verse 33, And if a man shall open a pit, or if a man shall dig a pit, and not cover it, and an ox or an ass fall therein, the owner of the pit shall make it good, and give money unto the owner of them, and the dead beast shall be his. The first thing you want to notice is that God was very practical in the application of the word to the lives of the children of Israel. You see, the children of Israel, many of their families kept cattle, and they kept sheep. And their work related to cattle rearing. And therefore, the word of God was very practical to the things they were doing. Also, because they had the background of violence in Egypt, they are to be taught on how to be merciful and compassionate. They are to know the sacredness of life and they needed to know how life should be protected. All this is teaching us, especially those of us who preach, teaching us important lessons. You see, when you, uh, let's say you are preaching in the village, for example, and you have cattle rearers, you have farmers, you have traders, the word of God that will preach should be made applicable to them. When you are in the city, on the other hand, and you have civil servants, you have masters and servants, and you have quite a lot of people in different professions. The word we preach should be made applicable to them too. You have men, you have women in the congregation. The word of God that we preach should be made applicable to them. So this is one lesson that we learn. That God made the word practical and applicable unto the children of Israel. Israel. In fact, you know, if we just give out the commandments of God, like we have learned in chapter 20, and there is no explanation, there is no application of the word to the people we are speaking to, then it will almost be useless because they will not know how they ought to live and what they ought to do. Now there is another thing we need to notice here. At first reading, a casual reader might say that these judgments will stand punishment for sin, are too strict or seemingly merciless. I want you to notice that when you really read with understanding, you see that the contrary is the case. We should know that these judgments were made to protect multitudes of poor people, weak people, defenseless people, innocent people. In fact, if you compare these judgments with the laws and the customs of the nations around the Israelites, you'll see a sharp contrast. These judgments will then seem, will then be seen as exceedingly pure, exceedingly wise, just, and humane. The children of Israel were in a position of great peril, and their safety depended upon the wisdom and the firmness of the law of God given to them through Moses. When you imagine three million people, in the wilderness. And they were going to search in the land of Canaan. And this was the time, the first time they ever got such freedom in their lives. You will know that their lives actually needed to be regulated properly. The same thing today. When you see many people that are now coming to the Lord and claiming to be with the Lord. You will see that the messages should regulate our lives. If we have been converted and redeemed and we now come to the Lord. It will be very important we know how we relate with one another. Our relationship should be guided and moderated by the word of God. Israel had no king except God. These millions of people born in slavery and just delivered from bondage 
were in danger of becoming ungovernable. These judgments then, specifying definite punishment for different crimes, showed Israel that no act of disobedience or rebellion or disregard for God's authority could be taken lightly. With well, that understanding, we now need to plunge into the chapter itself. The chapter is divided to three parts. Number one, servants' freedom and attachment to the master. Very important truth. Number two, penalty for depriving others of their life or of their rights. Number three, divine plan for man's protection. In fact, this number three divine plan for man's protection gives us the very basis and the very reason for all the commandments of God. If you consider any commandment of God, it is so that man can be protected. And it protects man in the family. It protects man in the city. It protects man in his community. In fact, it protects man in life in general. Do you know it goes beyond that? All the commandments of God is for the protection of man from indignation to come, from eternal punishment. In fact, when you think about all that God has done, all that God has said, the commandments of God, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, all the system of all the plan of redemption, the repentance and the praying and the faith and everything, all the plan of God, everything is for man's protection. That's why it's very important. Divine plan for man's protection. Now let's go back to point number one. The servant's freedom and attachment to the master. In Exodus chapter 21 from verse 1. Now these are the judgments which thou shalt set before them. It is noteworthy to know that here Moses was told that this was the word of the Lord. He had been given the Ten Commandments. Even the explanation to the Ten Commandments, even the application to them, those things were not left in the hands of Moses. Just to say whatever he wanted, the Lord came to him and the Lord told him, he said, Moses, do you know that you have to apply that word to the children of Israel? These are the detailed applications of the word unto them. What a great lesson for us. After we have got the word of God, our preaching, the explanation, the application of the word of God to the people that are listening to us, they should not just be coming out of our human brain. They should be led by the Spirit of God. And we should not say anything except what the Lord is saying. We should not explain anything, apply anything, except what the Lord is applying. The way the Lord applies the word is the way to apply the word. So that we are not found guilty of twisting the word of God, adding to the word of God, subtracting from the word of God. These are the judgments which thou shalt set before them. Moses was not free to teach whatever he wanted. Neither are we free today to teach whatever we want. Do you know a very good principle for preachers? Speak where the Lord speaks. Be quiet where the Lord is quiet. If the Lord is quiet about something, then don't talk about it. If the Lord is specifically saying something, then that is what to hammer on, and that is what to speak. And these are the judgments we thou shalt set before them. Now, this part concerns the relationship of the master to the servant. In verse 2, If thou buy an Hebrew slave, an Hebrew servant, six years, shall he serve. And in the seventh year, he shall go out for nothing, free for nothing. Now to start with, why would a Hebrew man be a slave or a servant? Why would a Hebrew, whether male or female, become a servant in any way at all? Oh, a very important question. In the land of Israel, there were various reasons why people voluntarily or compulsorily became slaves. Please understand, this is not teaching slave trade. This was talking about an institute, something that already existed. And because it already existed, the Lord wanted to speak to the issue. It is like, for example, there are some families here that have a maid serving them at home. When that situation already exists, then the word of God says they how to treat that maid. Or it is that there are people here. Whether you are a Christian or not, before you even became a Christian, maybe you have some apprentices with you. The Lord is not saying whether you should have or not. He's just telling you that now that you have that apprentice with you, 
here is outward. We have civil servants there, and we have those who might be boss or manager or director. And you have other people who are messengers. The fact is that messengers are there. Because the messengers are there, this is the way to act to the messenger. So what the Lord is saying here is that uh, there were some people that were servants. And the Lord wanted to show how the masters will act or relate with the servants. I said, how did these Hebrews come under slavery? Or under servitude, becoming slaves or servants of another Hebrew. It could come, number one, through poverty. Number two, through the fact that somebody has committed uh, the sin or of theft. And because he had nothing to pay back, he then was sold so that he could make restitution for what he had stolen. Number three, it could be because of debt. He was so so much that he couldn't pay. And because of that, he had to be sold. Do you remember that uh, parable that Jesus gave in Matthew chapter 18 of his servant that owed so much? He had nothing to pay. And therefore, the master in that parable was thinking of selling him, his wife, and children before he began to beg. And then the master had compassion on him. Do you remember that? And so in the land of Israel, uh, something like that debt could get an individual into a kind of slavery or servitude. Number four, it could be because of the exercise of parental authority. The parent had um, some need and they couldn't meet that need. And the only thing they could do in their own situation was to give out that servant or that child to go and serve. Maybe you have seen something like that in a situation also. That you will find that there are times that somebody who does not have enough to eat. Will just say, well, I'll do anything now. I don't even care if I'll be a messenger. That's it. Or it may be that somebody is owing debt, and then in the local court, and they said, how are you going to pay this debt? He might be a graduate, he might be whatever, but the debt is so great that he cannot pay. And then he said, by this date, make sure that you pay the debt. And then he says, well, anything I see now, if it's even a cook, or a, or a servant, or anything, I will do anything now to pay this debt. Do you see that point? Or it may be that because of parental authority, uh, don't you know that uh, sometimes at home, far away in the village, there will be a uh, situation whereby it may be the father could not uh, uh, get on very well. The children are so many, eight children, ten children, could not even feed them. And somebody will come from the town. And then he'll say, well, young man, if you can feed this boy, take him. And whatever you want to teach him, or uh, let him be your servant. Uh, let him learn uh, as a trade or particular work with you. For years, just let him stay with you. That will take the burden of feeding him away from my neck. That's what I'm saying. There were situations that brought some of the children of Israel into slavery. Let me just read some verses to you. In Leviticus chapter 25. Verse 39, And if thy brother that dwelleth by thee be waxing poor, and be sold unto thee, thou shalt not compel him to serve as a bond slave, as a bond servant. You see, that was the situation that brought them into the condition of being slaves. In Exodus chapter 22, verse 3, If the sun be risen upon him, there shall be blood shed for him. For he should make full restitution. If he has nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft. This is talking about somebody who has been caught stealing. And maybe already he has uh, squandered all that is all that he stole. And therefore he is not able to pay back. And it is so important that he pays back. Therefore he is sold into servanthood, into slavery to be able to pay for his theft. In Second Kings chapter 4. 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 1. Now there cried a certain woman of the wives of the sons of the prophets unto Elisha, saying, Thy servant, my husband, is dead. And thou knowest that thy servant did fear the Lord. And the creditor is come to take unto him my two sons for bondmen. Here is the case of death. The man do it. Uh, do one of the servants of the prophets, a religious man, perhaps a righteous man, but he did not take care of uh, things properly. And so he owed such great debt. And now after his death, they wanted to come and take the two sons uh, to be born men because of the dead. But the story there shows us that 
they didn't have to be slaves because if they would have faith, they could have miracles in their lives that would then relieve them or, or settle them from slavery. Because if you know that story, uh, Elisha said, what do you have at home? He said, just a, a little oil, go and borrow vessels, empty vessels, not a few. And then by faith she did and poured and then sold everything. And so she didn't have uh, to release the sons into slavery or to become bond men in Exodus chapter 21. Verse 7. And if a man sell his daughter to be a maid servant, you see here was another condition that a man having a daughter uh, sold the daughter into being a maid or a maid servant. Well, these were conditions in the land of Israel. And uh, these conditions brought some of them to become slaves. Yet the Lord asserted the slave's personal right, giving him the power of choice. Uh, you see, the Lord is so wonderful. He knew that that situation existed, and therefore I was going to relate or regulate the, the uh, situation. Exodus chapter 21 from verse 3 now. And he, and he came in, if he came in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he were married, then his uh, wife shall go out with him. Here the Lord was saying that his period of service will be limited to six years. By the seventh year, he will have to go out free. That he will not be a servant, he will not be a slave forever. Uh, this is a very important lesson for those of us who might have taken some young men. And you say you are teaching them, tailoring, the work of the mechanic, or selling spare parts, or whatever. Do you have any plan to release them anytime? Or are they just going to be there forever and ever? And they have no property? In fact, their servant here, he was allowed to marry. And he was allowed to take care of his family. And there are some people who say they are Christians. And they will have an apprentice. They will have a servant. They will have somebody working for them. They never think that these people are getting older. They never think that these people should have wife or should have children or should take care of themselves. But the Lord said, these servants had the right of choice. And at the sixth year, their, their service could be ended or terminated. And they could be released at the seventh year to be, to allow to, be, to be allowed to be free. In verse 4. If his master have given him a wife, and she have borne him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be, shall be her masters, and shall go out, but he shall go out by himself. You cannot understand that except you go to verse 5. And if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife, and my children, and I will not go out free, then his master shall bring him unto the judges. He shall also bring him to the door, and or, or unto the door of the unto the doorpost. And his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall serve him forever. This is talking about the free choice of the servant. That the servant could say, I love my master so much, and because of that, I want to remain. Now, he could love his master so much for a number of reasons. One, the master had given him his own daughter. And that really showed the relationship between that master and the servant. That the master was not treating him like a slave. He was not treating him like a nobody. But he treated him like a significant person. And even gave his own daughter to this servant. For you to understand that very well. You'll have to think of any of us here today. You have maybe a daughter. And somebody is serving you. And you love that servant so much. And you are so much interested in life of that person. That you even give your daughter to that individual. That must be a relationship of love indeed. Not only that, at the sixth, uh, at the sixth year, the man could go out free as his master. I showed love to him. God wanted a proof that this servant also had, or had recognized the intimacy that he had with the family. And was going to say, no, I'm not going to go out free. All I'm looking for is love. And I've got the love here. And I love my master because he loves me. And I love my wife, the daughter that he has given to me. And I love my children. And they are the grandchildren of my master. 
And therefore, it is like these two families are already emerging together. It's like uh, we love one another so much and the love is cementing our relationship together. And so, the servant will say, I will not go out free. It is telling not something here. The servant is seen as a man of feeling. And love is set up to be the highest motivation of enduring service. He only was to serve forever. That is, he was to serve for life if he chose to do so in continued servitude on account of the love of his master and the love for his wife and his children. This tells us something. That the service of love outstrips in dignity and surpasses in duration all other forms of service. It is telling us something that if you have servants working with you, if you have messengers working with you, if you have people that are lower in the cadre of responsibility, authority serving with you, you should love them so much that they don't even think of ever wanting to leave that employment. Love should be the very center of our relationship together. And then it says if the servant decided to continue to serve his master for life, his master shall bore his ear through with an awl. And it shall serve him forever. Now you need to understand something. That these uh, children of Israel, spiritually, they were like uh, children in the kindergarten. And important lessons were learned with some objects. Don't you see that's how we teach in the kindergarten? We teach by, you know, handling paper, showing something on the board, painting pictures, and doing something that they could handle, things they could see. In fact, we might even give them toys that in there to play with so that they will be able to learn something. And these children of Israel, because they were young in the understanding of the things of God, they were taught in this way. The significance of this ceremony is that uh, the mark will be a mark of permanent servitude. And it was calculated to impress the servant with the duty of hearing his master's orders and obeying them punctually. Every time he saw that mark there, he knew that it was the mark of perpetual servitude. Of course, he remember the pain. Because, you see, love goes along with pain. Well, that shouldn't surprise you. Doesn't a woman that gets pregnant know that at the day of laboring to deliver that child, that her pain will come? Oh, yes, she knows. But because of the love for the child and the love of having children, she will overlook the pain. The same thing with this servant. The servant will overlook the pain because of the love that he had for the master. Now, let's uh, apply it to those of us who are the children of God. We're studying about servants. And it might seem to be that, is this applicable to me? Is this applicable to you? Or perhaps you are saying, I'm not a slave. I'm not a servant. And so what is the implication of all this in my life? Oh, so much application. Come on to the New Testament. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Reading to you from verse 19. What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own, and ye are not your own? That means now you don't have the liberty you think you have. You are not your own. Why? In verse 20, for ye are bought with a price. Wait a minute. You are bought with a price? Oh yes, because you are so poor. You couldn't pay for the ransom. You couldn't pay for the ransom of your soul. Because of that spiritual poverty, that you had nothing to pay, that's the reason you had to be bought by the Lord Jesus Christ. And he paid the highest price, the greatest price, the precious blood of the Lamb. Not only that you owed a debt you couldn't pay. Because of the debt, instead of now just being a slave to serve in servitude all through your life, now the Lord has bought you with a price. In verse 20, For ye are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. It says now you belong to God and you should be a servant of the Lord. In First Corinthians chapter 7, and in verse 22, For he that is called in the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's free man. Likewise also, he that is called, being free, is Christ's servant. That means then, although you are not a servant to man, although you might be a boss, you might be a director, you might be a father, you might be a mother, you might be a respectable person in society, it says that the Lord has called you, you become Christ's servant. 
Christ servant. And because you are Christ servant now, all this is applicable unto every one of us. In fact, it, it, there's something very significant. If you look at uh, the word of God at the New Testament, you will see that in the New Testament, the apostles, they refer to themselves as the servants of the Lord. Don't, doesn't that tell you something? If the apostle will refer to himself as a servant of the Lord, how about those of us who are members in the body of Christ? Look at Philippians chapter 1 verse 1. Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ. The servants of Jesus Christ. You see, that is very important for you to notice that now that you are a child of God, you should see yourself as the servant of the Lord. Servant of the Lord. The servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you uh, look at other epistles also, this is the same thing that you will see. You will see that it says over and over, over and over, that these apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, they refer to themselves as servants. In Titus chapter 1 verse 1. Titus chapter 1 verse 1. It says, Paul is servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ. In the previous passage I read to you, he referred to himself as a servant of God. In this passage, it is a servant of Jesus Christ. James chapter 1 verse 1. James is servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, combining a servanthood to the Father and servanthood unto the Lord Jesus Christ. It is so very important that you will realize that if you have been born again, if you are a child of God, at the same time, you are a servant of the Lord. In 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 1, Simon Peter is servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. An apostle is someone that is saint. Someone that is saint. And when he says a servant of the Lord, as well as an apostle of the Lord, he saying, I'm a servant, I can only do what I'm saint to do. Jude, verse 1. Jude, the servant of Jesus Christ and the brother of James, to them that are sanctified by God the Father and preserved in Jesus Christ and called. Here we are being told again that that, uh, that uh, preacher or that uh, messenger of the gospel of the Lord is a servant of God. And so then you are a child of God, oh yes, also a servant of the Lord. You are bought with a price, so you have become the servant of the Lord. We have chosen the responsibility of perpetual service to the Lord. Now, the boring of the ear will cause special pain. But we are ready to submit both ears to the Lord so that we can have the mark of the Lord Jesus Christ upon our ears as a mark of consecration and commitment, telling the Lord we will hear all his orders, we will obey all his orders and commandments punctually. In fact, we are telling the Lord, we'll never leave a service. We'll never leave a service. There was a time that Jesus Christ spoke to his disciples and he said, Will you also go away? What was their answer? They answered, No, there's no other person to go to. Go to. In John chapter 6, John chapter 6, reading from verse 67. Then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will ye also go away? Then said Jesus to the twelve, will ye also go away? You see, in this chapter, the Lord Jesus Christ had declared unto them some deep truth of the word. And then we're told that some of his disciples at that time, they went back and they walked no more with him. And then Jesus pointing to the twelve, facing the twelve, he said, how about you? Are you going to stay or are you going to leave? After all, why are we going to leave? If the word appears difficult, remember, we're going to be held by the grace of God. Because His grace, His power, His strength, His divine ability will support us. What difficulty have we that He does not bear with us? What yoke does He have which is not easy? What burden that is not light? And so Peter, realizing that, he said in verse 68, Then Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Now as the word of eternal life, and the same thing that comes to you, to, to whom will you go? Doesn't the Lord have the word of eternal life? See what he has given you. He has given you eternal life. He has given you joy. He has given you peace. He has given you the keys of the kingdom of God. He has given you a place in the kingdom. 
Not only that, he has given you material blessings too. He has blessed your life. He has healed you. He has delivered you. Not only that, he is even preparing a place for you in heaven right now. And he's coming back to take you home. And if any believer uh, died before Jesus comes back, he's even going to raise you up. There will be resurrection of the dead. And he will take you to his bosom. He will take you to the very presence of God. And no wonder Peter said, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the word of eternal life. In verse 69. And we believe and are sure that thou art that Christ, the Son of the living God. Oh, he said, because of what you have given us, there is no place we are going. We are going to stay with you. We are going to remain with you. The person we are studying about in Exodus chapter 21, he said, because of the wife you have given me, because of the children you have given me, I am going to remain with you and serve you forever. For some of us, he has given us wives. He has given us husbands. Oh, you may say, I got married before I came to the gospel. That may be right. But what kind of husband did you have before you came to the gospel? What kind of wife did you have before you came to the gospel? Hasn't the gospel now changed your wife and changed your husband? Although you married before you came to the gospel, the Lord has converted your husband. And therefore, he has renewed your marriage. The Lord has converted your wife and has given you a new wife altogether. It's not the same person, but then the life is now changed. And there is peace at home because of what the Lord has done for you. What you are telling the Lord is the same thing that this servant was telling the master. I will never leave you. I will stay with you, Lord, because I love you so much. We must go on to point number two. In uh, verses uh, 7 to 11, you'll see, see that he's still talking about the servants. But now he's talking about the servants that were daughters, made servants. Now point number two from verse 12. Exodus chapter 21 verse 12. He that smiteth a man so that he die shall be surely put to death. Here the Lord was saying there will be penalty, punishment for those who deprive others of their lives. Therefore, if anybody killed, he too will lose his life. Now, this is very significant. If there was law, but there was no way of punishing lawbreakers, how will the law be upheld? And so this was God's way of, of, of upholding that law. Now, but the Lord made provision for a kind of a killing which was accidental, not intentional. Verse 13. And if a man lie not in way, but God deliver him into his son. Now, this is not saying literally that God sent him there to be killed. This is just the language if God permitted it. That's what is, students of the Bible, you need to study that and know that all the time. There will be many things that will be attributed to God. But all that it means is that God permitted it. God allowed it. God did not restrain it. It happened and God did not stop it. That's what it means. It says in verse 13, And if a man lie not in wait, but God delivered him into his hand, then I will appoint thee a place whither he shall flee. That in later chapters will be called the city of refuge. In verse 14, But if a man came or come presumptuously, deliberately, upon his neighbor to slay him with guile, Thou shalt take him from mine altar, that he may die. Now this is saying that if a person deliberately, intentionally, will go to take the life of another individual, he might even act religious and go to the altar, and be crying at the altar, and weeping at the altar, holding on to the horns of the altar. The Lord said, it's a wicked man. All his religion, his pretense, take him away, let him die. In verse 15, And he that smiteth his father, or his mother, shall surely be put to death. Now, can you see here, uh, the Lord is, uh, tell, was telling the people that they are to have respect for the commandments of the Lord. In uh, commandment number 5, we have been told, Honor thy father and thy mother, Exodus chapter 20, verse 12, that thy days may be long upon the earth, which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Here we are told of a child that might smite the father or the mother. While well, smiting the father could be a literal thing. In this world where there is no respect for authority, do you know, unfortunately, we sometimes read in the papers of children who beat, who smite, some even kill their parents. 
Now in the, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, such will draw capital punishment. But let us note something. There may be children that may not be physically beating their parents, but you know, you can smite your parents' authority by rebellion. That's what Absalom did. Or you can smite your parents' health and bring their gray ears with sorrow to the grave. That's what uh, the brothers of Joseph did or they wanted to do to Jacob because of their wickedness and misconduct. Or you could smite your parents' heart and break the heart of your parents by willful disobedience like the sons of Eli. You see, this is telling us that God, although God will forgive if you repent, but if you do not repent, if you continue smiting your parents and smiting your father or your mother or cursing them, insulting them, abusing them, you are heaping coals of fire upon your own head. Destruction will come. Look at verse 16. He that stealeth a man and selleth him, or if he be found in his son, he shall surely be put to death. You see those who kidnapped, and it also bore capital punishment. Verse 17. He that causeth his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. Verse 18. Now, you see, these uh, things related with the life of the children of Israel. In fact, it was teaching the children of Israel there should be no bitterness, no fighting, no quarreling, no violence, nothing that they will do that will injure the life of any other one. Verse 18, And if men strive together, and one smite another with a stone or with a spear, that he die not, but keepeth his bed, now, does that mean that's all right? Because uh, they could fight, but since the fellow did not die, that's all, forget about it, no, not at all. Look at verse 19. If he rise again and walk abroad upon a staff, then shall he that smote him be quit, that he shall not die. Only he shall pay for the loss of his time and shall cause him to be thoroughly healed. Uh, you see what this is saying. It said if two men were fighting and then one hurt the other. It means that when, he, when the man gets well, before the man gets well, the fellow that hurt him like that, he'll have to see that he was thoroughly healed. Not only that, he will pay for the loss of his time. You see, the word of God is very full. The word of God, is uh, the, the explanations are wonderful. Uh, take for example today, a man is working in a factory. And as he was walking in the factory, uh, it may be that the machine of the factory will cut his hand. Or it, an accident might happen. What is that factory supposed to do? The principle here is that you will pay for the loss of his time. And that company will make sure that that person is thoroughly healed. Whatever they cause, the medical bill. You, you see the word of God is very clear. And this is showing us respect and regard for the life of man. In verse 20, if a man smite a servant or is made with a rod and he die under his hand, he shall surely be punished. You see here that again that you cannot just act in cruelty uh, to your servant or to your maid and say, well, he is uh, just a servant. He's be, he was sold because of his death. Uh, dead. He was sold because of his poverty or he was sold because of theft. Still, you'll be merciful and compassionate. In fact, still talking about servants, let us come on to verse 26. If a man smite the eye of a servant or the eye of his maid, that it perish, that is, is, he loses the eye or she loses the eye, he shall let him go free for his eye's sake. That is, all the service he should have rendered unto you, everything will now replace the lost eye. Well, all these things are showing that there should be mercy. There should be compassion. And these things checked and controlled the children of Israel so that they will not just act any way they wanted to act. It is teaching us something that life is God's most sacred gift. And God has provided many safeguards for its preservation. These judgments laid heavy punishment on the murderers. Those who smite or curse the father as we have read or the kidnappers, or the violent people, they'll have to pay the penalty. Of course, we need to know the standard in the New Testament. He that hateth his brother is a murderer, the Bible says. And ye know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. In fact, 
anger in the heart gives unconscious malicious power to the will. And man is responsible for the effects of his anger, even though these effects are more disastrous than he intended. But now we need to note the teaching here. You're asking now, perhaps, what if we find somebody who kills another person and he happens to be in the church? What should be done? Does that mean that the church will bring him out and the members of the church will stone him that he will die? No, not at all. You say, why? Uh, now understand this. With the children of Israel, you understand that the civil law, the religious law, everything came together because as a whole nation, they didn't have separate police station or separate court or separate judges, or separate magistrates, and separate pastors and preachers. Everything was all together. But you see, in the world today, there is a quite a, a, a demarcation. You have the magistrates there, you have the police station there, you have the army there, and you have the prison there, then you have the church as well. So what happens today is that it is a court that will deal with all those cases. Oh, you say, why should we allow that? Because we have read in that Exodus that this is what should be done. Why shouldn't the church do everything today? Oh, because the New Testament has now regulated it more clearly. Look at it in Romans chapter 13. Romans chapter 13 from verse 1. Let every soul be subject unto higher powers. These are talking of the powers of the high court, the powers of the magistrates, the powers of the judges, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. I told you that at the time of the children of Israel, it was at the kindergarten stage. It was the very beginning. Because it was the very beginning, everything was together. But then God later ordained that there will be government, there will be, uh, there will be magistrates, there will be high courts, police station, and all these things. In verse 2, Whosoever therefore resisteth the power, resisteth the ordinance of God, and they that receive shall receive to themselves damnation. For the rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Will thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. For he is the minister of God to thee for good. Is saying that now that responsibility has been given to the magistrates and the courts and the government. And in that area to check crime. In that area to check um, people that want to take the lives of other people. Or people that will want to injure others. You have the whole system of the law. And it says in that way, in that capacity, that the ministers of God on behalf of the nation. In verse 4, but if thou do that which is evil... Be afraid, for he heareth, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. So you can see then that this has passed into the hands of the government. In verse 5, wherefore ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. For for this cause pay ye tribute also talking about tax. Now you know he's talking about the government. For they are God's ministers, attending continually upon this very thing. So then it is the government, the police force, or the army, or the courts, or all these, uh, all these areas of administration in the nation that will take care of those areas. But does that mean the church has nothing to do? Once uh, anybody can be in the church, if they kill, if they steal, if they injure other people, all that we say is that it's in the hand of the government, so the church has nothing to think about it, has nothing to do about it. No, that's not what it says. The government will deal with, will deal with the part that concerns them, but the church also has something to do. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, reading from verse 13. But them that are without God judges. Now look at this part. Therefore put away that are from among you, that wicked person. Who is that wicked person? Anybody that will kill his fellow brother, fellow sister, that's a wicked person. 
anybody that will fight and injure the other and the other fellow that's a wicked person anyone that will commit abortion for example and shed innocent blood that's a wicked person of course uh, this one is also applicable to adultery morality that's a wicked person that will go into outrageous and uh, sins like that that will defile uh, the church and defile the people in the church it says therefore put away from among yourself that wicked person maybe you want to read from verse 11 but now i've written unto you not to keep company if any man be called a brother and he be a fornicator or covetous or idolater or a railer somebody that is very quarrelsome or a drunkard an extortioner with such an one no not to eat that's talking about discipline and it's saying that such people should face the consequence of their sin the consequence of the evil that they commit so then on the one hand because that brother or that sister or that church member is a citizen in the country if he does anything wrong if he kills if he uh, does what he shouldn't have done which is criminal of course the police and the government will handle him not only that even before they do the church has to put out that wicked person this is telling us that our actions have great consequences sin will be punished god is not an indulgent god well, you, you see something here. There are some people that will say hey, there shouldn't be any punishment. There shouldn't be any rebuke. There shouldn't be any chastisement. There shouldn't be any correction. In fact, they tell us that it will be a very good school where there is no spanking, there's no rebuke, there's no correction, there's no beating. That's what they want. Also, they say in the home, it will be a wonderful home. If there is no spanking, there's no correction, there's no rebuke, there's no chastisement, no discipline. That's what people want. In fact, some people are advocating for the absence, total absence of punishment in every country. They say it will be a wonderful country when there is no punishment uh, laid upon anyone. If you do that, there will be anarchy, there will be confusion, there will be atrocities, there will be wickedness unchecked, ex so extensive nobody will be able to contain. Also, you see that uh, there are people that will say in the church, you know, they say the church should be a loving place. It should create an atmosphere of love and favor in the church without discipline at all. Well, do you know what that will do? In fact, look at Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 11. If you come to the situation where there's never correction, there's never rebuke, there's no chastisement, there's no discipline, men will go from bad to worse. And backsliders will go from backsliding to apostasy. In Ecclesiastes chapter 8 verse 11. Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. Therefore the hearts of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Uh, you see, uh, well, that's what makes people to continue to do evil. In fact, even in the country. Do you know the way some of the criminals think? They feel if I do evil, uh, probably I will not be caught. That's why they continue to do evil. Other people, they say, even if I am caught, perhaps I will not be jailed. Other people will say, maybe even if I'm jailed, it will not be too long. And even if it, is, uh, if it appears that the punishment is heavy, what I gain through the crime may be what I'm losing through the punishment. That's why the hearts of men are set in them to do evil. The same thing in the, in the home. If your children know that they get away with everything they do, that even if I do that thing, there will be no punishment. They will be going from bad to worse. They will be doing evil. The same thing in the church. If uh, the people in the church feel that, well, there's no consequence to your action, you can do whatever you want. You can sin. You can. Nobody will uphold holiness because there's no chastisement and there is no evil. Uh, people in the church will say, maybe if I sin, they will not know it. Maybe even if they know it, I can argue my way through and I can excuse it. I can give a lot of excuses. And I know our leader is uh, such a gentle person is going to take my excuse. Or even if they don't uh, take my excuse and they're going to punish me, the punishment will not be too long because I know that after one week they rebuke me. I know that our leader is, uh, you know, so compassionate and so loving and so weak. That uh, he will say, well, don't, don't do that again. The people are going to be going from bad to worse. And they go from backsliding to apostasy. That they will not be able to uphold the standard of the word of God 
anymore. Now, these people who say that all that we're to do is just to show favor unto people. We're not to punish them at all. We're not to discipline them at all. What does the Bible say? Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 10. Let favor be showed to the wicked. Yet will he not learn righteousness. You see that? If you say all we're going to be doing is preach the love of God and the grace of God and the mercy of God and preach positive messages of faith and healing and deliverance and provision and care for the people, whatever they're doing, don't mind what they do. Love will change them. Grace will change them. The favor will change them. The Bible says no. Let favor be shown to the wicked. Yet will he not learn righteousness in the land of uprightness. He will deal unjustly and will not behold the majesty of the Lord. He will not see the greatness and the goodness and the grace and the majesty and the glory of God. If we just show him favor without rebuking sin. What are we to do? What is it that brings change in the lives of people? Look at verse 9 of that same Isaiah 26. With my soul. Have I desired thee in the night? Yea, with my spirit within me will I seek thee early. Now this is the part I really want you to take note of. For when thy judgments are in the earth. You see that? When thy judgments are in the earth, what will happen? The inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. You see that is what makes the people within the church uh, to learn righteousness. Now let me tell you something. You might think that Already we are, we're doing well in the church. Um, you see, well, we thank God in our church. We discipline people who sin. I don't think we do. Because, you see, most of the people will say, I'm not a worker in any case. And since I'm not a worker, what are they going to do? If I kill, if I commit abortion, if I commit adultery, if I commit fornication, if I'm not going to go to them that I want to get married in the church, how can they punish me? How can they discipline me? Other people say, I'm not a worker. And since I'm not a worker, they cannot say, I stop you from the work. What discipline are they going to give me? And since uh, there's nothing like that, you see the people, that's why some people even say, no, I don't want to be a worker. I want to be a free man. Because, you see, the one that is not a worker, nobody ever rebukes him. Nobody ever corrects him. And because of that, they think they can continue to do evil. And you find a lot of these people that are just hiding in the church. They say they are not workers and they are misbehaving. Some of them are accused of witchcraft. Other people of sorcery. Other people of destroying their neighbor. Other people of stealing from the, their places of work. Other people of being rebellious and they are destroying the standard of the teaching of the word of God. And then uh, they say, well, there's nothing that can be done. Now, let me ask you. All these things that we're reading about in Exodus, was it only for the workers? For the elders? For the priests? No. For everyone in Israel. Therefore, when you really think about discipline, you think about everyone in the church. Everyone in the church. Which means then, if you associate with this church and you are coming to this church and you commit sin, well, even if, even if you are not born again, if you commit sin that is scandalous, that is going to destroy the lives of other people who think that you are a Christian, although you are not a Christian, who think that you are born again and you are part of us, although you are not part of us, if you sin, according to the word of God, we shall stand you up and publicly rebuke and chastise and discipline you. And if it is something that uh, you should have died for in the Old Testament, we don't kill you now, but we excommunicate you. We put you out of the church. That's the Bible. And we don't do it privately, we do it publicly. You see, when they stoned those people in the Old Testament, they didn't do it privately, they did it publicly. That's the only way to keep the church clean. That's the only way to keep the church holy. Now let's go back to Exodus chapter 21. Exodus chapter 21, we're looking at point 3. Divine plan for man's protection. Divine plan for man's protection. These verses are just very interesting, very wonderful. It shows you how the Lord will go into details of how to protect the lives of people and the lives of animals and how to protect property as well. In Exodus chapter 21 from verse 28, If an ox go a man or a woman, that they die, then the ox shall be surely stoned, and his flesh shall not be eaten. But the owner of the ox shall be quit. 
if for the first time an ox belonging to a man accidentally uh, injured or pushed a man or a woman and that woman died because there's nobody to help or rescue now that ox will be killed will be destroyed but you can see the justice of god that the owner will be free because the owner knew nothing about it now this is very important now look at verse 29 but if the ox were want to push with his arm in time past and it has been testified to his owner that he has not kept him in but that he has killed a man or a woman the ox shall be stoned and its owner shall be put to death now can you see this if the owner knew about it that these uh, ox had been pushing and were killed and then he had been warned about it but the owner will not keep it in, keep him in then what it means is that if that ox did that the owner also will be killed will suffer for it now you see here we are now i don't have an ox and so that was the application of that to me oh very much you see the ox at that time was the bearer of burdens the ox at that time was the one pulling the was the one pulling the cart or pulling the tool of plowing the farm you, know, you see today we don't have ox but we have tractor we don't have ox but we have vehicle we don't have ox but we have truck and lorries we don't have ox but we have the things that we use and we have those who drive them you see if uh, you know accident happen it's just accidental then you say well that is accident we're sorry about it and we're caring about it but we know it was an accident but let's say you have a driver that you know is always careless and already has broken somebody's bone and then he has also done another thing injuring people and the people only escaped narrowly and every time they bring that case to you they see what see what your driver is doing already see this child now the child is going to lose about one year from school because the child has to be taken to the orthopedic hospital and then you say just say eh, eh, what was the child finding by finding by the side of the road eh, these children that will never leave the road for vehicles and you know your driver is careless do you know that in the sight of god you're also guilty if you don't send that driver away for him to have the punishment for his evil and not only that uh, let's say you are a nurse or let's say that you are the a doctor in an hospital and you have a particular nurse and this not very very careless will mix this together and mix this together and then give to the patients and you know that and not just that you are losing business but you are losing this patient and the person will say i came to your hospital last week and then i got medicine and then when I got the medicine, look at this repercussion. Look at what I'm going through. In fact, I don't understand myself. I'm dying. And then you check up uh, what was the thing that was done. You checked up and you saw that the nurse really didn't know her work and mixed a lot of things together and wanted, would have killed this woman, this innocent person. Now what do you do? If you just say, well, uh, we, we, don't, we need a lot of nurses and these nurses nowadays, they are not well trained. What could we do? If that nurse kills people, do you know, if you keep such a nurse, you'll be guilty in the sight of the Lord. You see, these things are very, very serious. Uh, let's go on to verse 33. And if a man shall open a pit, and if a man shall dig, or if a man shall dig a pit, and not cover it, or an ox, and an ox, or an ass fall therein, the owner of the pit shall make it good, and give money, unto the owner of them and the dead beast shall be eased this is very practical this is saying you see the children of israel there were times that they needed to dig a well or they needed to dig a pit a pit as reservoir for water in their farm and you see they had farms adjacent to one another if they didn't cover that pit and another person's ox or ass or animal got into that pit and drowned then it says that the person that had that pit will pay for it. Now you can see then that the Lord didn't want any carelessness that related to life. Do you know that all this is still practiced today? That for example, if uh, you have on the side, on the road, right at the center of the road, a big ditch, and during this type of rain, 
it is flooded and the vehicles will get into it and just say uh, you know it will damage lives and damage property what will the neighbors do if they have some compassion and some mercy they will put old tire there and they will put a stick with a red flag there the red flag warning people saying that there is danger here that's what is that's what is there that you will give that precaution the sign or the signal of precaution you know sometimes you are traveling and on the road you have a little bridge covering a little river and because the flood has been so much the river had um, swollen up not only that the little bridge has been swept away then what the villagers will do if they have mercy if they have compassion if they know the significance of life is that they'll put some signboard there and say there's danger here that uh, the bridge has been swept up otherwise lives will be lost people will die do you know that if you're in a situation like that to give that warning and you do not give the warning and the people perish and die like that you'll be held responsible by the lord well this is teaching us quite a lot these verses show god's regard for the safety of man and beast if an ox as i've told you injured a man for the first time only the life of the ox was forfeited but if the owner of the ox acquainted with the proof vicious character of that beast neglected to put that beast under restraint and the ox killed someone the owner was punished for murder life is superior to property that's what we're learning to prevent evil by wise precaution is our bounding duty and it's an indirect method of doing good well do you know that if there is evil that can be prevented and you don't prevent it then you are guilty because man is responsible for preventable evil if an oxen as fell into an uncovered pit the owner of the pit will make it good well that is will pay for the damage now will not the almighty hold us resp responsible for the moral pits that we have left uncovered have we placed enough precautionary signs in sufficient number of places along life's highway to prevent deception danger and death now think about parents for example you may have at home some bottles of poison maybe to kill rats are you having some precaution to make sure that the children never get there mistake it for another thing and drink and then you lose your child our pastors for example and preachers are they warning of error that is very destructive warning of things that might destroy the lives of members of the congregation our teachers at school warning the warning the ch children of the things that they might do that could destroy their lives or do ch teachers just say well we, we don't have time for these children and the teachers instead of doing what they ought to do will be carrying clothes about to sell and they will not really stay in class to uh, take care of the children and watch over the lives of the children how about doctors pharmacies and and the chemists are they making sure that the drugs they give out to rescue lives that they are actually uh, not responsible for the death of those who perish uh, through some fraudulent acts how about drivers electricians electricians that know that uh, there is exposed wire with electric current that could kill people destroy people are you very careful are you putting the signs of danger there how about the factory workers are the factory superintendents are they so careful that they will not expose the workers to danger engineers and builders those who build are you building carefully to specifications so that the house does not collapse to destroy many people we, we heard in the news recently a particular hotel that just collapsed and hundreds of people were uh, just buried under the rubbles of that thing you see sometimes uh, it is because of the carelessness of the engineers and the builders and the architects you see all this is telling us that god will punish criminal carelessness if your kind of carelessness brought a death upon people god is not going to overlook it preventable accidents in our industries which are fatal to life cannot be overlooked by god what's the conclusion of all these things we're seeing we, we've learned a lot today what is the conclusion that the lord is bringing before us as a lot of as a result of all that we have learned in hebrews chapter 12 and verse 14 hebrews chapter 12 verse 14 follow peace with all men will you between servants 
And masters, follow peace with all men. Between you and your maid, between you and those who are working with you under your authority, follow peace with all men. Take care of them, love them, have compassion on them. Follow peace with all men, between husband and wife. No violence, no bitterness, no fighting, no injuring of one another. What shall we say of the husband that will injure the wife? Wife that will injure the husband. Follow peace with all men. What shall we say of those who administer drugs unto people, and yet what they administer will, will cause them to lose their lives? Follow peace with all men. In fact, you should be a peacemaker too. You should make sure there's no bitterness, there's no fighting, there's no quarreling, there's no violent action coming from you. You are soft, you are kind, you are merciful, you are compassionate, you are considerate. Follow peace with all men. You will not want to kill, directly or indirectly. You will not want to revenge. You will not want to uh, strike a man, smite a man, your father, your mother, even you, uh, the people, adults that are with you. You will not want to do that. Follow peace with all men and holiness. Holiness of heart, holiness of life. Make sure there is no stumbling block in your life, something that will make other people to stumble and die spiritually. Follow holiness too with all men, without which no man shall see the Lord. Without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. As we examine ourselves on the basis of the word of God today, can we say we are following peace with all men? Can we say we have a kind, gentle, mild, soft life? Can we say that we are not violent, we are not quarrelsome? Can we say that we are not destructive to anybody's property or anybody's life, anybody's family? Can we say we are truly following holiness, holiness unto the Lord? You see, if a person will not follow holiness, if all the checks and the controls and everything that God is doing, with all the teaching, if a person will not follow holiness, the result is that the person will suffer in hellfire. In Revelation chapter 21 verse 8, but the fearful and unbelieving and abominable and murderers, murderers in particular, because we've studied much of that today, and all mongers and sorcerers and adulterers and, and uh, idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake with burning with fire and brimstone. My question to you is, where will you spend eternity? Are you going to escape the judgment of God? There's a sad day coming. It will be the judgment day of the Lord. Will you escape? Are you living a righteous life? Have you got grace in your life? And you count the lives of people around you uh, to be very precious uh, to, the, uh, to you and to the Lord and to the kingdom of God? And you are not selling out anything, giving out anything, tobacco, alcohol, whatever, that will endanger their lives and kill them and destroy them? Let's rise up and talk to the Lord. That the Lord will make us the people we ought to be. We'll see the commandments of God, that God will help us. To keep the commandments of God, he has abundance of grace to give you. He has strength to give you, power to give you, so that you will live righteously, you will live a life that is glorifying unto the Lord. Follow peace with all men, and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord.